Itam Daktas, uh, focus on the contemporary literature. And um, mainly, you know, my expertise, as you know, is transcatheter intervention. So I'll leave the surgical bit to Ram at the end. So I hope to cover this during the talk. So whether to treat, when to treat, how to treat, we we'll focus as a I mentioned on uh, transcatheter closure and how we could select patient that would most benefit from uh, closure of preterm ductus. Okay, so it's very interesting when we look back at the history of pediatric cardiac surgery and intervention, and this humble little duck, duck closure has really been momentous. So the first idea of how to close the PDA was presented in uh, 1907 by John Munro, but as you all know, the legendary operation was performed by Robert Gross in 1938, and that marked the birth of pediatric cardiac surgery. It's a very interesting story. So legend has it that the cardiologist John Hubbard drew his attention to the need for surgical closure of PDA. He then did lots of experimental work on dogs and other animals as preparation. However, his superior at that time wouldn't grant him permission to do the operation. But as soon as he left for summer vacation, his deputy, Thomas Landman, then gave him the authorization. So <laughs> Gross then planned two surgeries on patients with open duct on the same day so that if the first operation was not successful, he would still have another chance. It's very clever. So he finally operated on a seven-year-old girl named uh, Lorraine Sweeney at Boston. The duct was first closed with a snare and he waited for a couple of minutes. The blood pressure rose and then he put a single ligature and uh, permanently closed the duct. So on the first post-operative day, the patient did very well and was sitting in an armchair. And on the third day, she was walking around. And interestingly, apparently he then met the head of his department in the cricket club. And when asked if there was any news about the department, he said, oh, nothing, nothing unusual. But in fact, the operation had made you know, hit news and the patient was actually an American Heart Association poster child. So it was a remarkable history. Three decades later, PDA was uh, closure was again the first congenital cardiac lesion to be closed percutaneously. So a group in Germany, Potsman et al, deployed an um, alcohol foam plug through an 18 French femoral arterial shift to close a large PDA in a 17-year-old boy. And there you can see the picture of the foam plug that they were using. I couldn't find a picture of Potsman first, therefore I put a picture of uh, superheroes there. And, you know, I think it's pretty amazing what is done. So, uh, sorry. So 30 years on and after countless innovations of devices and delivery shifts from 18 French right down to three French shift, now PDA closure has evolved to the treatment of choice in infants, more than six kilos, children and adults. And you know, we're all well versed with the literature supporting the efficacy and long-term safety profile of uh, PDA closure, as you can see that. However, Application in neonates, especially premature infants, are limited uh, by the proportionally large delivery shifts and you know, them being an overall really fragile group, as you know, the neonatologists will know, and concerns of you know, high adverse events associated with catheterizing these small infants. So the risk of adverse events is actually inversely proportional to the weight of the, of the child. But over the last decade, I would say, transcatheter closure has again emerged as another frontier in the interventional cardiology owing to new technology. And this is really a new milestone in um, being able to close uh, PDA in infants even as small as a uh, less than a thousand grams. I put a few uh, pictures of the pioneers in this field. And you might recognize New Wilson, a couple of other people, Evan Zan, and uh, especially uh, some Sham Sanatandan, who's in Memphis and who's done a lot of work in uh, preterm PDA closure. And I want to thank him as well for lending me you know, some of the slides that I will uh, be presenting later. So I picked up the, this editorial and um, as wisely cautioned by New Wilson, who's one of the pioneers, um, indeed uh, preterm PDA closure transcatheterly is um, a, a titanic movement in technology and technique. However, you should be aware of the icebergs. 
So because we can do it, should we do it? So I think this is a question that you know both cardiologists and neonatologists are trying to explore. You know whether we should really close this and what is the best timing and which infants should be selected for PDA closure. So just a brief overview of the management options for significant ducts. I think you're all well versed with this. So that's the conservative or expectative approach where, you know, obviously we use uh, positive pressure ventilation, diuretics, fluid restriction, etc. to provide time for spontaneous closure of the ducts and to avoid complications of drug and surgery. However, there's ample evidence suggesting that lengthy exposure to a large duct is associated with increased incidence of um, BPD, um, IVH, neck, and increased mor mor mortality, and we'll review some of the literature later. So drug therapy is generally the first line treatment, but uh, there's variable success rates depend on, depending on the gestational age and duration of treatment and well-known side effects on renal function and uh, gut perfusion. Surgical ligation obviously is well established and uh, provides definitive closure, but you can see a long list of potential problems such as you know, walker cord palsy, pneumothoraces, infection, bleeding, which are real significant issues in these very tiny babies. And uh, what's interesting is uh, in the late 1990s, sort of early 20. 2000s, there's been observational studies associating uh, surgical ligation of PDA with long-term neurodevelopmental impairment, and that's really shifted the trend towards more conservative management in many centres you know, internationally from the 2010s onwards. So here you can see a multi-center study showing the changing trends in the management of PDA, particularly in infants less than 1,500 grams. And that's in the era of 2008 to 2014, including 134 centers and 28,000 infants. So I've circled them in blue and red. So red is surgical ligation. So you can see um, the trend going downwards and conservative treatment circled in blue, the trend going upwards. And then this is another study really looking at uh, referral for surgical um, ligation in premature ducts uh, between two eras. So the black dots are the earlier era from 2006 to 2010. So the black dots was their starting point of the percentage that was referred to surgical ligation. And then the gray bars that's trending downwards is from the second era where you see almost universally across the centers, there's a reduction in referral for surgical ligation. So what is the body of evidence that's swinging this uh, change in neonatal practice? I mean, I really salute neonatologists. There is extensive literature investigating the effects of treatment of PDA on long-term outcomes. And this is immediately the picture that came to my mind after I did a quick PubMed search. Like, how do you eat an elephant? How do you digest all the literature? And I'm sure the neonatologists will have a better handle of this subject, but uh, I will offer a very bite-sized view of uh, what I've gleaned from the literature. So, I think the evidence um, against uh, treatment has mainly been uh, three major reasons, but I'm sure there are a lot. Um, there are a lot of early randomized control studies that have shown no effect on neonatal morbidities or mortalities with PDA treatment, whether medical therapy or surgical therapy. And we will um, look at some of this uh, in the next slide. The other main reason is that uh, the argument is the duct will eventually and spontaneously close. So why would you expose the child to the complications associated with either medical therapy or surgical therapy? Lastly, there's a the notion of causing harm without any proven benefit of PDA treatment. So I think this would be unpalatable to you know, any clinician. For example, the studies that I've mentioned uh, associating neurodevelopmental impairment with PDA compared to just using medical therapy alone. However, when we think about these studies, we realize then that there's really significant 
bias of this observation and studies because of many confounding factors. So just thinking simplistically, um, infants that are referred for ligation are generally likely to be more ill and they have had larger ductal shunts compared to infants who are just treated medical, um, medically. So they are already at higher risk of neurodevelopmental impairment even before ligation. And the other thing is surgical ligation itself may improve survival. And we all know that being on the ventilator for a long time itself, it's, it's a strong predictor of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment. So this is a nice um, table from you know, uh, Clayman, who's done quite a few nice review articles on the um, evidence so far. So initially, there are a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials of treatment versus no treatment and prophylactic or early treatment. And they all essentially showed no effects on the outcomes of death, BPD and NEC. However, when we think about these studies that compare treatment to no treatment, we find that a lot of these studies, if not the vast majority, fail to recognize that no treatment doesn't mean genuinely no treatment. So a lot of these infants are actually having other treatment modalities, such as you know, inotropic support, fluid restriction, and you know, other measures to try and counter the hemodynamic consequences of the PDA. So if morbidities are found in the no treatment group or the so-called no treatment group, one has to ask, are the morbidities due to the persistent duct itself or could it be due to the other concurrent treatments that the infant is getting whilst waiting for spontaneous closure? So this really bias you know, the, the results quite a lot. And the other thing is um, between these uh, studies, um, patients who are on the conservative um, arm, if they deteriorated significantly, there's a lot of um, change in pathways, so treatment crossover basically. So if they meet a certain rescue criteria, then they switch over to the treatment arm. So then it's very difficult to interpret or be clear about the results of this two arm if there's significant crossover. Uh, and the other big argument is that uh, all these um, studies were presented in the, uh, or were, were done in the late uh, 1990s, so it's really 20 years old. And um, the treatment, for example, you know, surfactant and you know, all the better ventilation strategies would have changed now. So thus, you know, the results of those studies still stand in the current age. So because of all these arguments and, you know, uh, of the earlier studies, then there came another flood of studies called the quality improvement studies. So these studies are designed to examine the role of um, prolonged PDA exposure, comparing one era to another era. So an era where initially treatment were given prophylactically or early compared to a later era where no treatment was given on the assumption that you know, if you're comparing one era to the other era, then the other management strategies are more standardized. Therefore, you limit some of the confounding effects. So these studies actually found some reduction in uh, pulmonary hemorrhage in BPD when the ducts are treated early. And then most recently, there's the PDA tolerate trial that is trying to limit confounders from ducts that would close spontaneously. So essentially, they recruited that, um, sorry, infants late, so seven days on, and that essentially takes out the argument of some of these ducts might close um, earlier on its own without any treatment. Um, the study actually showed no effects on BPD, uh, NEC, and any other uh, outcomes of interest. However, what that mentioned then is, are we then treating the babies a little bit too late? So taking together the quality improvement studies and PDA tolerate trials, um, we are really thinking, is there a critical window of treating this PDA? If we miss this window and we treat them, we might not see any um, effect. But if we treat them at this critical window, then we might get good effects uh, from PDA closure. So there's a lot of 
compelling uh, evidence, I think, associated with uh, PDA and uh, pulmonary morbidity to actually think about treating these uh, infants earlier. So in premature baboons, uh, animal studies were exposed to moderate PDA for 14 days. And if they are compared to age-matched fetuses, who are obviously still you know, in mommy's tummy, there is significantly altered alveolar growth. So simplification of the alveolar and increased surface area of the alveoli. And when these um, uh, baboons were treated with ibuprofen and duct were closed, that prevented further deterioration of both the pulmonary function and alveolar development. And the histological findings of this impaired alveolarization is very similar to the characteristic changes that we see in BPD and chronic lung disease in a baboon lung model. So in the picture, you can see the different stages of lung maturation, and this is from a mouse model. So during the late canalicular stage, which is usually 22 to 26 weeks gestation, the terminal bronchioles becomes larger and lung tissues becomes more vascular with formation of the alveolar ducts. And then in the secular stage, which is later development, so 27 weeks onwards, there are many more terminal sacs and alveolar ducts that form with thinning of the um, epithelial surface for gas exchange. And you can see in the bottom uh, diagram, in um, BPT, there's alveolar simplification with larger alveoli and very fewer septae. And, very, uh, and the pulmonary arteries are also smaller with uh, decreased capillary density. And this is akin to changes in adult mice with COPD. So just a reminder of the relationship uh, between resistance and flow. So by Ohm's law, pressure you know, in any vascular bed is really a product of resistance and blood flow. So we know that PVR normally drops after birth, the PA pressure falls normally, and the medial layer of the smooth muscle becomes thin. But if the duct is widely open, the pulmonary artery pressure may not fall as rapidly and uh, remains quite raised for a little while. So with large ducts, there may be systemic pressures um, due to equalization you know, of the large duct, large defect, really. Um, therefore, I think sometimes you know, uh, just looking at elevated PA pressure in the context of, of large duct, more often it implies that there's a large flow shun as opposed to increased resistance. So in fact, if you have increased resistance, then uh, you should have a, a, a decrease in blood flow. Another consideration is that in the very premature babies, their pulmonary arteries have a very small amount of muscular tissue in the media of the smooth muscle and lower intrinsic tone. Therefore, they are unable to constrict appropriately. And subsequently, they develop a, a pulmonary overcirculation faster and have a, a, you know, a larger hemodynamic consequence. So from Poiseuille's law, a small increase in radius with the same pressure gradient actually increases the flow significantly. So vessel two, as you can see in the diagram, has twice the radius of vessel one, but it receives 16 times as much flow of vessel one. Unfortunately, I think just looking you know, around and among centers, there's no clear consensus of you know, what criteria actually constitutes a hemodynamically significant duct. And I think you know, some of these clinical measures uh, is reasonable to you know, uh, decide whether the child is hemodynamically unstable from a duct. So if you have oxygenation difficulty, high ventilatory setting, feed intolerance, you know, significant hypertension requiring anotropic support, huge cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema on chest x-ray and metabolic acidosis. Um, what about echocardiographic criteria? So again, there's no set rules. But uh, you can see from the diagram, there are a lot of uh, measures that uh, we have used. But I think at the end of the day, it's just really a combination of picture um, and referring when you know, uh, as, a, as the right timing. So 
people have looked at ductal diameter. Generally, that diameter of more than two millimeters in a very small preterm baby is considered a large duct. Um, you can look at duct velocity. So low velocity, both in systole and diastole, indicates a large, unrest large unrestrictive shunt. You can look at integrate uh, uh, flow, left pulmonary artery flow from the duct. Um, People have also looked at uh, transmitral Doppler, so an increase in EA ratio indicates that the LV is very volume loaded and there's a high LV EDP. Um, you can look at uh, the LA to aortic ratio. You can also look at retro retrograde diastolic flow, so more than 40% is significant reverse uh, flow reverse uh, from, the, um, from the duct. So I think the most common scenarios that uh, we see are really uh, what's illustrated on the diagram. So, for example, case one uh, is showing a one-month-old preterm infant, maybe born at 24 week, uh, born at 24 weeks, and you see significant uh, left atrial and ventricular dilation. So basically, there's a large, large left to right shunt from the PDA. Um, and, you know, after diagnostic CAF, I think this would be a PDA that would be obviously safe to close. Um, and the elevation, as we mentioned earlier, of um, PA pressure is likely flow-related. Re flow In the second case, this could be a later age infant, maybe, you know, five, six months old, 24 weeker, which has now developed severe pulmonary hypertension with right to left shunting. So this is relatively less uh, common, but you see severe right ventricular hypertrophy, dilation, bowing of the septum in systole because of the suprasystemic uh, RV pressure. So now the PDA serves as a pop-off to relieve the right ventricular pressure load and to preserve uh, ventricular function. And it also may help sustain the cardiac output you know, through the right to left flow at the cost of desaturation. So now duct closure would not be a good thing and, you know, it's uh, obviously not recommended and this is what uh, we would like to avoid. Um, pulmonary vasodilators may be used in this case and that might encourage some reverse remodeling and provide a window of opportunity for future closure of the duct, but, you know, we're really unclear about uh, these babies when, you know, the scenario has progressed to such a stage. So the third scenario is somewhere intermediate in between. So maybe a three month, four month old, again, X, you know, 25, 24 weeker with moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension and a large duct um, and the velocity of the duct may be low volume, uh, maybe intermittent bidirectional shunt. Um, so these babies are also very difficult to manage. So if you use oxygen or pulmonary vasodilator to help manage the uh, pulmonary hypertension, then you may reverse it and you may encourage a lot of pulmonary blood flow. On the other hand, if you don't treat the pH, then it may lead to irreversible pH. So I think you know, when we reach kind of this stage, um, diagnostic CAF actually provides uh, a very good opportunity for direct, direct hemodynamics and also an opportunity for test occlusion of these ducts. And if, you know, hemodynamics are then favourable, then we can proceed to um, permanent closure. So I think we've uh, talked a lot about the background of why, how, when we close, and I feel like I've earned uh, myself the <laughs> reason to talk about transcatheter closure now. So there are you know, different techniques as, um, as uh, we've mentioned earlier. So the emergence of transcatheter PDA closure actually date back to uh, the late 1990s, uh, 2000s. And since then, there's been growing interest uh, in a catheter-based solution to preterm ducts. So as mentioned earlier, there are remarkable advances in technologies and techniques and really increased collaboration between neonatologists and cardiologists to improve the efficacy and um, safety of PDA closure in these premature babies. And this is what we're hoping to develop in the Northwest region. 
So in the tiny fragile babies, I think the main concern is not just you know, whether we can do it, the feasibility or the technical success, but the rates of complications. So that includes you know, uh, avoiding hemodynamic instability during the procedure, device-related obstruction to the LPA and aorta, particularly vascular injury and mortality. And in the next few slides, I'll present some of the um, larger studies of preemie PDA closures and how things have evolved over the years. So this is one of the initial and larger studies looking at uh, AVP2, so on the vascular plaque, which is shown in the diagram for closure of uh, preterm PDAs. So you can see that uh, the, the sample size is not big, it's 52 infants and the um, babies that was first trout on were of a later gestation. So this study include less than 32 weeker, um, but good success rates, so 88% and very low complication rates. Um, but one of the big things that people have noticed is the arterial injury uh, causing limb ischemia due to the procedure. So from that study, people then improvise to see if we can close the duct just through the venous access. And in this study, you see that they've performed the procedure in fewer patients and in smaller patients, but they have avoided arterial access and used venous access only. And there's a lot of um, uh, realization now that actually transthoracic access echo guidance is very effective uh, for, for duct closure. And this is generally what's been adopted uh, in many centers that close preemie uh, ducts nowadays. There's also one center that actually invented a mini C arm where they would bring the fluoroscopy arm to the neonatal unit and perform PDA closure at the bedside. So one of the newest development is, uh, uh, the, is the piccolo occluder or the ADO2AS. So this occluder is um, developed specifically for preterm ducts in that the this diameter is only a tiny bit bigger than the waist and it's designed to be deployed in the duct itself to avoid uh, obstruction of both the LPA and the aorta. And it has many sizes and lengths to select the right you know, device to be completely within the center of the duct itself. So this is a picture to show you know, the proportion of this device compared to a pens. And um, this is a diagram of, uh, sorry, just a steel diagram of an injection in the pulmonary artery. So this is only transvenous root access injection into the pulmonary artery. And you see the long tubular duct, so a type F duct, feta type duct, that's uh, a characteristic of preterm ducts. And uh, you can't see it too well, I apologize. But where the arrow points, that's the device that's set within the duct itself. And the injection is into the PA. So you see the LPA filling up nicely and there's no compression from the duct itself. And you see the black dot that indicates the end of the occluder. And that's really well within the duct and not encroaching on the aorta as well. Sorry, I need to dismiss this. Okay, I think I'll skip through that because I uh, might have gone overboard with putting too many studies in. Um, with the Piccolo trial, this is recently published in 2020. So they've done more than 100 uh, patients in this particular trial, 100 patients, and they've achieved um, actually 100% or sorry, 99% occlusion rate with very low uh, complications. So again, proving the feasibility of uh, this device in very small babies. And then this is another French study, which is a national experience. Again, 102 patients. Sorry, hang on a bit. Also. 
um, procedure success rate of 99%. They've had pretty long follow-up, uh, had seven mortality, but none related to procedure, and relatively low complication rates. And LPA stenosis and coordination, which uh, rarely require um, uh, surgical intervention, mainly they either outgrow it or they have uh, percutaneous interventions to address it later. There's a risk of tricuspid valve injury from crossing with the delivery shift, but I think that would only get better you know, with improved technique and you're know, getting over the learning curve. So that's another device which I will skip over. Um, so overall, I think um, the studies so far have demonstrated really consistent success rate and you know, more than 99% in recent publications with larger cohorts. And what's important is that follow up, the complete closure rate is actually very good. Um, uh, I've mentioned significant procedure adverse events are generally low embolization rates, relatively high initially, but that's also you know, proven to be low in the later studies. And uh, there is rarely any mortality uh, reported associated with PDA closure. So just because we can close the duct with uh, a device, should we? I mean, surgery has been an established option for a long, long time. So is there any evidence supporting transcatheter closure over surgical ligation in preterm infants? So this is a study from CHOP in uh, 2013. So they looked at the respiratory status of preterm infants before and after percutaneous closure compared to those who underwent surgical ligation as controls. So they used this respiratory severity score, which is uh, replicated in a lot of studies after this and, and in neonatal literature. So the respiratory severity score is a product of mean airway pressure and the FiO2. So a smaller score, basically means that there's less respiratory support and a value of less than two is really considered minimal support. So this is a very small study, I'm sure you will agree, and uh, it's, it's only looking at eight pairs of uh, um, infants who are on positive airway ventilation um, going into surgical ligation or percutaneous closure. And uh, you can see that those that underwent percutaneous closure had a significantly shorter time compared to the surgical group going back to the baseline respiratory status after their procedure. So the group then concluded that you know, PDA closure in small infants on respiratory support is equivalent in safety and efficacy and offers shorter recovery time than uh, P uh, PDA ligation. Another very similar study with a, a bigger group, so comparing PDA closure and surgical ligation and really showing essentially you know, the same things that uh, those who underwent catheter closure had faster time to extubation and faster time to recovery of their baseline uh, uh, respiratory severity score. The other common phenomenon uh, post ligation is, well, common post ligation syndrome, really, and that's um, evidence of a significant LV impairment needing inotropic support or escalation of respiratory support in the 24 hours immediately following PDA ligation. So, the etiology of this is not well known, but uh, it's thought to be the inability of the premature neonate uh, myocardium to tolerate any acute increases in um, afterload. Therefore, you know, the, the impaired LV function and you know, uh, high LVDP pulmonary edema. Um, in this very small study, and I think they just analyze it as you know, part uh, uh, sub-analysis, really, they looked at the incidence of uh, PL S in uh, post ligation syndrome in uh, their cohort of babies who underwent uh, transcatheter closure. And uh, there's actually none that they found who had clinical post ligation syndrome that required uh, active treatment. They found reduced ejection fraction in three babies and they all normalized. And they just compared this to a 30% 30 incidence of PLE with their surgical ligation cohort um, and uh, these babies were age and weight match compared to their um, uh, percutaneous closure cohort. So suggesting you know, uh, less incidence of post ligation syndrome with ductal closure via the catheter route. 
So then the last question that I will try to cover is the question about when to close. Um, is there any literature on the ideal timing for transcatheter closure? So again, I'm mainly focusing on uh, transcatheter closure. I'm sure there are other literature on uh, surgical closure. So this is a nice uh, paper from uh, Shum looking at the hemodynamic and clinical effects of PDA closure. And obviously he has the benefit of you know, all the PVR studies and the hemodynamics that he had when he was closing you know, all these ducts. Okay, so he looked at a hundred of the patients that his uh, closed ducts on and these infants were all less than 27 weeks gestation at birth and weighing less than one kilo at birth. So he divided these groups into three groups. So those who had their transcatheter closure less than four weeks postnatal age, between four and eight weeks postnatal age, and more than eight weeks postnatal age. And you can see that uh, these three groups were significantly different in terms of the procedure age and weight. So these were the baseline hemodynamics. And you can see that uh, the group three infants, so those who were referred late or you know, later, more than eight weeks, actually had higher baseline pulmonary vascular resistance and higher pulmonary artery to aortic um, <clears throat> ratio compared to group one, where the um, babies were taken to the cath lab under four weeks. And this is again looking at the respiratory severity score that we talked about. So these are the Kaplan-Meier curves comparing the three groups. So you can see that in the group that had comparatively late closure, so in group three, took a longer time for them to have a respiratory severity score of less than two. In fact, those that had closure within the first four weeks, so by 60 days, that right, yeah. By 60 days, almost all of them had returned to respiratory severity score of less than two, whereas in the last group, group three, there's still about 30% that still had significant ventilatory requirements. They then went on to you know, analyze or divided their group to see what the influences of high baseline PVR compared to um, those with uh, lesser PVR. So the cutoff was three. And you know, again, the point that we've uh, I've mentioned you know, many times, you know, there's a quicker time to extubation and quicker time to return to baseline respiratory severity um, score. Sorry, this takes a while. So the other thing that um, they found in this paper, interestingly, is that there is increased growth velocity in those babies that had their PDA closure um, performed earlier. This is, uh, I think, did they reach? Yeah, so they reached statistical significance in that group one had uh, uh, 25 grams per day increase uh, compared to 16 grams per day for the other group. So there's maybe evidence to support that earlier closure might help, but obviously you know, a lot of other you know, neonatal problems come into play there. So then the last question is, is there evidence to support PDA closure over conservative uh, management? Um, I think there's no clear data at the moment. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the earlier randomized studies are uh, biased in a lot of ways. Um, so at the moment, uh, Nationwide Hospital is uh, piloting a study to look particularly at that. So it's called the pivotal trial. So they're looking at uh, percutaneous closure versus conservative management. And this is genuinely, genuinely leaving the duct alone. So they're recruiting patients less than 28 weeks, you know, more than 14 days, so uh, more than one kilos and seeing what effect uh, percutaneous closure versus conservative um, management will bring. 
and uh, in the neonate site as well. I think that's this Benedictus trial and uh, checking yesterday again, I don't think there's any updated results yet. So they were looking at medical therapy versus uh, conservative therapy. So I think all these new studies in light of all the evidence that we had so far and you know, knowing all the limitations would be very informative um, to answer the questions of whether this uh, pre-dentum ducts should be treated and you know, what the ideal timing is. So for me, really, the conclusion is that you know, ultimately we will need this super you know, well-designed randomized control studies to give us more information. Um, as it stands now, I think there's some evidence supporting earlier treatment. I mean, the timeline is still not clear, but from you know, Sham's experience and the study that I've presented, seems like less than four weeks of age is beneficial before the onset of you know, high PVR. And this is mainly in a select group of premature infants. So mainly those under 28 weeks uh, gestation who, was, who are really struggling and the less than one kilo baby um, because the likelihood of spontaneous closures in this baby is really you know, in the 15% range even after one or two weeks. Um, I think results of transcatheter PDA closure in preterm infants have been very, very encouraging and very exciting times for us interventionists. Um, the midterm outcomes have been, you know, consistently high, and this is only going to improve with, you know, uh, overcoming the learning curve in, you know, every center and uh, more development of devices and techniques. Complication rates at the moment seems to be low, and they are lower in the recent data compared to the earlier uh, experience. Um, but I have to say that it is still relatively limited uh, published experience compared to you know, all the other age groups. And uh, transcatheter PDA closure, if I may say, does offer certain advantages over surgical ligation. So faster respiratory recovery, possible evidence of less uh, post-ligation syndrome, and you know the, all the morbidities associated with a uh, thoracotomy, you know, infection, uh, you know, everything that we've mentioned earlier. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, welcome any discussion or questions. Uh, Arul, we can't hear. Switch on your mic. No. Mm. Okay, while, while we wait, can I just make a little comment and then uh, I think it's important that we get the opinion from everybody, all the cardiologists, PICU and uh, you the, the, the surgeons here. Um, so it's okay. Uh, I, I can hear myself. Arul, can you switch off your I'll plug in microphone. So, so the questions here are whether PDA should be closed or not, and what is the right time to close, and what's the modality to close. So, let us park the argument between transcatheter or surgery aside. It doesn't really matter, and probably transcatheter is is the latest advancement. Probably it has proved some advantages, uh, but but we can park that aside. And and the, clearly the discussion point here is. Do the PDS need to be closed in prematures? Um, we know that not all of them needs closing, but which group of PDS should be closed and what is the ideal time? Um, and uh, I can say and show you if, if I can share my screen. Let me see. OK, can you see my screen? Yeah, so yep. I can make a statement that the country is divided. Um, it's not a political statement, but it's a PDA statement. I'll take you through that. I mean, look at these um, procedures on the right hand side, Southampton. Um, it's this the data for 2014 to 2017 is three years. So they do about 148 PDA ligations in three year period. In the South, 
and Evelina about 100, GOS about 93. But if you come north, Liverpool, our center is much bigger than Southampton in terms of volume, but we do only 46 in three years. If you divide that about 15 a year versus 50 a year in Southampton, and so is Bristol and other centers. So there is there's no consensus in the country as to the benefits of PDA ligation and uh, the south is taking a different route and the north is taking a different route. I'll close this if I can. OK. Uh, OK, so for me, I mean, uh, as I said, it's important because Lang, myself and another neonatologist, we three are contributing to a chapter about PDA ligation, indications, timing, as well as the, the mode. So that's why we want your opinion as well. So for me, it is clear that uh, not all PDAs need to be closed. There are certain group of PDAs which needs to be closed. PDA in cardiology term, nothing but a big left to right shunt. And, the, and we know the problems with the left to right shunt are failure to thrive, um, uh, respiratory effects, and as well as in the long term, pulmonary hypertension, or irreversible pulmonary hypertension. So for me, those prematures who require invasive ventilation or inotropic support for a duration of more than two weeks are those who require non-invasive ventilatory support for more than two weeks and echocardiographic evidence of a large PDA, which is more than two millimeter, large left to right shunt with evidence of LV and LA dilatation. Failure of medical therapy is a clear indication for any form of closure of the PDA. Um, I, I just want your opinion. Is, is that statement wrong or what would you do with premature PDAs? Still there? Can Amada? I chip in? Yeah. So one of the things you've got to be careful of is um, using surrogates for your outcome. So really what you want as your outcome is some sort of measure of health at like two or three years of age, really long term outcomes. And they're always difficult to um, obtain. They're really challenging. So technically, people want their um, papers published within a year or two. So they tend to pick out outcomes which they can measure within a year or two. And that's not to be to be ignored, but it may be, and you've got to be careful of this, that though you appear to have a higher PVR a couple of months of age, if you, do, um, if you don't close a significant duct, and I have to say the evidence that uh, Leng's presented leans me towards closing earlier, but, that, but you have to be careful that when you look, you don't find that two years down the line, the ones that you closed actually did worse overall. It's just your outcome measures really need to be measured in the global health of the patient and not, it's a good starting point and it justifies a proper randomized controlled trial, but it's still not a great end point to just sort of say whether things looked bad at a month of age or two months of age, when what you're really interested in, what the child looked like at two years of age or 20 years of age. Yeah. Sorry, Rob, are you suggesting then that we, so you're saying that we are not, we shouldn't be closing this ducts if we find out? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting if no. that, in a, in a perfect world, and I don't know, you you would be doing doing it as part of a trial where you were looking at outcomes a significant way down the line. But that, the problem with that is nobody ever wants to. People want to get, get you know, the government doesn't really want to, there's no money in it for anybody. Nobody wants to, it's, it's much more expensive doing that sort of trial. Um, I'm just, I'm just observing that. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think that the, that's a very, very good idea, Rob, but um, it, we don't have that study and it, it'll no, be good. Those, no, well, those who have done would, would publish another paper sometime later as to what they observed four years yeah. later, five yeah. years later. 
that's not the case. But given the evidence what we have, it is a little bit confusing. There some says that there's no advantage. Some says that yes, there is advantage. What what do you feel? What what's your per, feeling? Per, personally, uh, it looks like it's a beneficial thing to me. And if you can do, and if you can if you can do it with less. So one of the problems is if you and I'm not wishing to um, diss it or anything, but if you have to open somebody's chest and leave them scarred and distort the chest, which is a is a long term sequelae, then um, that is that has to be balanced between your your benefits. If you can close it, leaving no apparent mark, leaving there's no. I don't think we've got any downsides to long term. We've been putting duct devices in patients for a long time, and I've not come across any long term side effects. Of course, they might they might have a side effect at age sixty, but at the moment that seems to be a very minimally invasive, minimal side effects, successful. So. I think you you know you're in a position to um, uh, justify that that step. Um, I think if that if that can't be done, I think the evidence that we have leans towards even surgical closure if you have to. Well said, Rob. Well said. So first of all, I was just going to say to Leng that the presentation was fantastic. It summarized mm -hmm. it extremely well. And uh, going back to Ram, see the between the south and north, the divide is because. The people, mainly Neil Wilson, who is a pro PDA closer advocate, and then few other people just push this PDA to be closed early, and also the neonatologist. But compared to North, especially women's and both Manchester, they're not very keen for PDA to be closed early. And that's maybe, I mean, from Northwest I'm talking about. So with this presentation backed by um, some scientific evidence, we should be able to get more patients to come in and to close the PDA early. The the smallest that we have done here is 2.3 kilograms. So we should push the boundaries and get this program started soon. Um, I think I forgot to mention, Leng, the presentation was excellent. It's a very good scientific presentation. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. So. But it's excellent. But Adul, I mean, and Leng, the, the the Shams paper which you quoted between um, four weeks to eight weeks, that does make a difference, isn't it? So if you were to close a PDA, for me, that is the ideal time you have to. So uh, I, I know there are a lot of PDAs who do not, do not need closing. They're progressing well if they do not require any Correct. form of oxygen therapy. We know that even oxygen therapy long term is not good for their lungs. Uh, and uh, interesting, the lung terminology is changing. We still keep calling chronic lung disease, but they don't call that anymore, isn't it? They call it as bronchopulmonary disease. Correct. So, uh, yeah. So if, if you were to make any difference, that's the ideal time we should intervene between four to eight weeks for those particular group of premature PDAs who are still requiring some form of ventilatory and oxygen treatment with evidence of no weight growth, failing to thrive and etc. Uh, but it's good to hear from other cardiologists and uh, ICU and the surgeons, Joyce and uh, Fu. Can I, can I just point out, I do have a conflict of interest because I only came in about halfway through because I was on another meeting, but I just saw the, the latest stuff, which looked very good. Uh, it's, it's an excellent presentation, Rob. It's recorded. It's like, at, yeah, at the no, beginning no, it's, class, it's, it's was, worth yeah. watching again. That's the most important <laughs> All right. I, I do have I do have a bit of a comment. I didn't follow completely, but I was just wondering from our um, this is digressing, but from our recent m, m last week or the week before where we had quite a number of XPREM PDAs who didn't do exactly well after PDA ligation. I wonder whether some of these uh, patients whom we are treating so conservatively for so long, have we left them too late? Therefore, they have had a poorer outcome after cardiac surgery. So as Leng puts it, if we were to sort of intervene on them much earlier and in a much less invasive way, um, would would these sort of XPREM babies have done a lot better in the short term? Um, yes, as well as in the long term, which we don't know, um, you know, what the outcome would be like um, if we had left them alone and if they had not had any surgery, would they be any better off two years down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line? 
Um, you're right, Joyce. I mean, we don't follow up these patients. Unfortunately, it's only a small number we see at the end of the other spectrum, which we are not happy with. I mean, the case we are going to do this Friday is, is a premature PDA came in with uh, almost irreversible pulmonary hypertension or, or significant pulmonary hypertension. Now we're closing the duct. We're leaving a fenestrated ASD for this baby. So the risk has now increased to 25% for this child. Um, and of course, we don't see many. We only see few. But but that that those few cases we see make a huge difference for us to push for um, early closure for those who needs closing. So Ram, you're you're right. You know the question is those that we see yeah. when they finally get to us to either have an interventional procedure or a surgical procedure, have they been referred too late? What is too late and what is too early? On one hand, we don't want to do them too early, but on the other hand, we don't want to leave the ones that are too late that whatever we do makes no difference to the outcome. You're not wrong, we can't hear. I'm not really... Sorry, two people have had their hands up before me. I'm just having a kind of moan in the corner, really. <laughs> Can I, well, now you've, now you've the problem with that question, it's a very good question, but you then have to sit back and how would you design an experiment which answered it? And then you've got to ask yourself the question, what is your number needed to treat? And then you've got to ask yourself, if your treatment has a downside, what is the risk to the patients who you treated you didn't need to treat who get exposed to the downside of your procedure versus the patients who needed your treatment but you couldn't identify them in your you know it's really it's very easy to look now and say oh if we treated this child earlier we'd have been better but the question you have to ask is could you have told this child when they were when they were a month old yeah. anyway uh, it's not that it's not a reasonable question but when you start trying to design an experiment in your head about how you would find out what the relative risks and benefits are, you find you've got to do very complex studies. And I come back to the fact that on the whole, the medical profession doesn't really like doing that because it's just too resource intensive and it takes a long time. And people's, the whole point about um, Research, I mean, it's one of the failures of research is it's very short termist in many ways. People need to churn out papers each year. They need to have a um, and, 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 and sitting there and investing in outcomes which might be 10 or 20 years down the line is not um, is not kind of easy for them. I'm not saying they don't do it, but it's not easy to uh, to do that. I mean, um, there is actually a really nice quote about um, I'll have to look it up about. Uh, societies flourish when people plant trees that they'll never see grow, which is all about, you know, investing in the long term future rather than in a short term future. It's a good question, Joyce. It's a perfectly reasonable question. But if you ask yourself how you're going to answer it, it becomes really difficult to know how you're going to answer it. Um, I'll show, I'll show I, I agree with you, Rob. Um, the problem is that, you know, we don't most people are not that patient to wait 10, 20 years to see what the long-term outcomes are. And also in the absence of a perfect evidence, you have to act with the evidence you have got. Is that correct? No, that, that, that's a fair point. Yeah, isn't fair it? Point. Because we may not have the perfect evidence, but we just have to work with the evidence we have. Um, there are other people who wanted to, Fu and Nayan and Ramesh. Okay, I'll I'll ask the uh, I'll ask the questions. Thanks, uh, uh, Sokling. That was a great presentation, an enlightening experience, I have to say. Uh, I have seen a lot of these kids coming in uh, for PDA ligation here, uh, and it seems that they are all the our cohort are all coming late. Uh, I don't know the outcome because I don't follow them. So the neonatologists are the best people to uh, judge uh, even the short term effects. But I take all the conversation on board, including Rob's, that we don't have data. But from what you presented, it seems to me that uh, early management in the preterm baby is the right thing to do at the moment. And how we get that uh, the long-term data 
is questionable. Yes, it could be Sham and other colleagues who've already done this. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of work may produce this data in the future, but at the moment, I'm comfortable with suggesting early treatment. The only question I have is two, really. One is we are potentially seeing uh, a big increase in our numbers from the data that Ram presented, almost three times as many coming in for uh, PDA uh, device closure. Uh, and whether we have the capacity to do it, uh, that's one. And the second no, sorry, thing is- Sorry, let me just uh, clear that. It's, it's the other way around. We are seeing less PDS here than in the South. So 50 per year in Southampton versus 15 per year in Aldehe. Yes, I know. So we are saying if we start doing the things that Southampton are doing, our numbers okay. are going to go up. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, okay, you know. I, I get it. Yeah, but yeah, but so hopefully okay. they, hopefully they are intervention so they don't come to you. They extubate and then go back to the water. Yeah. And I see true. Um, that's so, un uh, unlikely. <laughs> no, I mean that, that's the future, isn't it? That's a progress we expect you guys to do it. I mean, <laughs> I mean it, we might. We, we might but have guys, hang on, other... guys, we're talking about neonates who wouldn't be on the ward. They're going to need intensive care patients. Correct. Sorry, just remember that as a cohort we're talking about dealing with. Less, yeah. less than one kilo. We're going yes. to get this brand new neonatal unit in Aldehe. So that will solve your problem. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, you, I mean, can, they, you, can they, invoke, they, you can invoke resources that don't exist yet. That's fair enough. There might be benefits in terms of reduction in number of patients who have chronic lung disease, you know, later, uh, which we might not see immediately, yeah. but that might happen. Yeah. Uh, so that was one question. Yeah. The second question was, of course, uh, you've mentioned that already. Uh, I was thinking for the late group where they don't do as well and the PDA is actually a blow off valve, will we'll adding uh, septostomy at the same time uh, improve their uh, you know, the chances of success, but with the additional risks of a septostomy. I don't know if there are any studies looking at that uh, soft length, something that came to my mind, maybe completely irrelevant. No, I Thanks. think that and that's a very good thought but uh, putting it into context we're talking about babies who are you know 1.5 kilos 2 kilos less than 1 kilo so it would be extremely high risk to create such a septostomy technically and the motor of all these procedures I mean I haven't gone into how the program was developed I was actually quite um, uh, fortunate that I was at sick kids at that point when they were developing the program but it requires a lot of collaboration it's not a single uh, operator work it is the whole team getting on board on the safe transfer of a neonate uh, you know temperature is a real issue in the cath lab in this premature babies it's anesthetic support because some of these babies may be oscillated and you can't oscillate a baby in a theater so trialing them on you know a couple of hours of conventional ventilation on the neonatal unit to see if they would tolerate like a half an hour procedure and the motto is to really go in quick do a hemodynamics access the pda you know, have echo there to scan. We try and minimize fluoroscopy, minimize uh, contrast. Um, we even echo babies over a plastic cover. So they're basically completely backed, like you know, you were in a womb, uh, in, a, in a whole plastic bag. Uh, you echo over the plastic bag, you do your procedure in and out back into the incubator. So, um, from talking to Sham as well, you know, they generally, you know, if the PVR was high, they would do a quick um, nitrate oxide and oxygen test as well. They wouldn't occlude any um, ducts that still had a PVR more than uh, five. And I would be even more conservative in that, that I wouldn't you know, even consider if PVR drops less than four. So there are a lot of considerations into uh, all this. OK, great, thanks. I've got, a, I've got another point now, and that is that studies are often done by teams who've actually managed to bring, they're not often replicated when you distribute them out to the general. That's just generally true of medical, medical management of things, anything. You do a study and it shows a benefit, but when you actually put it out in the community and everybody's having a go, every Tom, Dick and Harry, they don't get as good results. Not to, not to, but you know, just to, 
No, completely agreed, Rob. You know, despite my presentation, you know, nothing is taken lightly. You know, this will involve a lot of people and a lot of effort, and there will be a learning curve to get over. Uh, Fu, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I missed out a little bit. Um, I'm in clinic. Um, so excellent presentation, Lang. Um, that summarizes a lot of the key points. Um, there are conferences about this topic. It keep popping up now and then. Every single time, every uh, any meeting with a hint of intervention or neonatology. So I guess um, going back to Rob's um, comments is is completely valid. Uh, but I think ultimately to get the the um, the hundred percent correct answer. We'll, we'll never get there, um, and I think as as a unit, um, we my, my feeling is that um, we could um, um, decide wh which route we want to embark upon. Um, decide like, that over the next um, five years or so. This is what we're doing. This is a, a criteria for referral. This is a criteria for intervention of or for surgery, and then so the, that's the only way we know uh, what works uh, for us, what works for our region, for our results and our patients. So my feeling would be like probably um, good is is we should intervene a bit earlier before the um, the complications has occurred um, since the procedure are uh, are having low risks and um, and um, uh, potentially can create a lot of benefits. Excellent, thanks. Uh, just to add my little bit, I mean I agree with a lot of the points that have been made so far. I think one of your strongest slides that you had, Lang, from a fantastic presentation was that slide which showed the different uh, age uh, ages at which the PDA was closed. So that was, I think it was within the first two weeks, two to four weeks or four to eight weeks, and then after eight weeks. And that, that showed a very strong, uh, that was a very strong argument as to early closure. Now, I agree with Rob in the fact that we don't have long-term uh, evidence, and I'm hoping the groups that are doing this at, an, at a, at a uh, in large numbers will provide that evidence with time. But given the data that we have now, combination of historical and what we're seeing coming out at the moment, uh, I think as a group, we need to be uh, quite proactive in letting uh, teams know that there is benefit in closing this. And I, I think the argument I echo uh, Ram's points about it isn't in a discussion regarding surgical or device or interventional closure. It is essentially closure or non-closure uh, because the benefit to the child long term is there from what we can see. Uh, I think with time, interventional closure will, will probably become standard of care, but we're looking at a, a long learning curve and an institutional and a supportive learning curve. So I think that'll come. But in the interim, well, we we need to make a kind of position to the region that uh, these kids, yes, if if we haven't had appropriate uh, changes in PDA and uh, improvement in patient status, then they should be heading down the route of closure of the duct by whichever means is available at present and which will change with time. So I think that that as a as a group we need to. Uh, it's very much we need to. Given given the data and, and information we have available, that's something that we need to. Uh, we probably do need to make make a, a statement out and and disseminate that knowledge, because uh, the the data is there. Thanks. Thank you, Ramesh. Any more comments? Um, yeah, I just wanted to come back yet again and just say, <laughs> despite despite my counselling, my gut feeling is this seems like the right way to go. Just to, uh, and in fact, even going back to surgical closure may well have actually be the right way to to go. Some of those um, figures about um, progression or re, you know reduction in ventilatory requirements and things, I find it hard to believe that being ventilated for longer periods and having uh, hemodynamic thrashing of the lungs for longer periods is dismissible in your long-term health. I find that hard to believe. That could be wrong, and that would need proving, but that that does not fit with my sense of uh, uh, thing. And I certainly know, talking to the uh, intensivists, and uh, Nyan might correct me on this, but being ventilated for more than two weeks on intensive care is a really bad thing, and is if that's it's a really, really bad thing for outcomes and, and so on. So 
I can't see why neonates being ventilated for longer than they need to be is good for them. Can't see it. It's likely to be good for them. Yeah, thank you, Rob. I, I think clearly we, we lack the evidence in that point of view, isn't it? There's no comparison between um, the differences of oxygen requirement, ventilation, NEC, pulmonary hypertension in those who are ligated and those who are not ligated. Um, we don't have I think, that. I think, I think you've got to remember the history of the whole thing. Yeah. This comes out of um, the development of a kind of basically a, a gut feeling de decisions about management, which is everybody felt that closing the doctor was the right thing to do and do it. And then some people, maybe like me, who come along and said, we haven't really we haven't really proved this is the right thing to do. And there was a bit of a kind of like, well, let's just throw it all away then and start again without, I don't know, without swapping to an alternative evidence-based outcome. It just kind of like, well, let's just stop doing what we're doing and leave it. And so we've kind of done this not very good trial. Um, and it, we ought to know by now, we ought to have some evidence about even long-term outcomes for the general strategy. But then it's just difficult to get people to kind of collate all the boring information and put it together. I would find it hard to believe that they don't do better with those significant ducts got rid of and getting off the ventilator quicker, personally. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Leng, once again, it's an excellent presentation. So do you think we should um, uh, change the protocol somehow and disseminate it to the network? And the few things. I mean, we need to take the neonatologist's uh, yeah. mm. views as well because uh, they might see something different. I mean, within the available literature, I think the northern neonatologists are looking at one direction of evidence, southern neonatologists looking at another direction of evidence. Uh, but what would have been nice from the neonatologists here to look back and then see, suppose like the ventilatory time, oxygen requirement time, hospital stay for those who were ligated and a comparable group to see those who are not ligated. So that, that is something easy that for the neonatologists to do retrospectively. Um, but uh, there is a significant difference of opinion among the neonatologists and, mm. uh, and the group. So I, I think we should... I, I, I also think in light of the recent uh, experience in closing ducts percutaneously uh, in younger neonates and very premature babies um, instead of uh, surgery, it's, I think it's a good time to plan this ahead as well and then perhaps to embark along the same line because um, uh, the evidence has historically has been collected so far, has been dating back to many, many decades. And, uh, this, and as you know, it's, uh, it's like a, an even split um, of, of opinion. Of opinion. Uh, and this is what we kind of just keep going round and round um, and hence the, um, the course of action. And again, there's no kind of brilliant biomarkers for when you're facing the patient, everyone's unique, and, and I guess it would be very different. So, um, if like I just echo the points of other speakers previously, um, if we can um, um, endorse um, this is what we think is going to be in the next few years, or perhaps, and we would like your support and as to see what they think. Uh, yeah, whether that's the right approach. When I, I mean, I, uh, we go to, um, I can go to, well, with the pediatric network and meeting and some of the PEC-6 and most of them are neonatologists. So potentially when, when I, we will go to our peripheral hospitals, we can, can have a kind of collective opinion that way as well as collecting the evidence. Because I think, I guess every unit is, approach is different. And when you collect data from the region, there'll be even more heterogeneous. Yeah, Link, Rob. Yeah, no, I agree. So I think we started the conversation here among ourselves, PICU, and if I, you know, gather correctly, our general impression is that we like to, you know, have the referrals sure. in earlier, and yeah. there's yeah. some benefit mm -hmm. in whether surgical or transcatheter closure early, 
So we can then now start the conversation, you know, with peripheral hospitals and you neonatal know, units, you know, gather what their thoughts are. And ultimately, we should probably develop a protocol for referral um, and take it from there. My, my view would be that coming at this from a persuading people point of view and having an objective analysis of risk benefits, you are likely to get a better judged outcome than going, oh, I think we should just close them or, you know. And that's why, that's on the whole, why our evidence, our medicine is generally getting better. We're dropping therapies that don't work. And we're when we introduce new therapies, we ask much more carefully whether it really works and what it, how it works. And there are still flaws in that, but I think we're much better at, uh, much better at doing it. So it's a bit like revisiting the whole thing and just starting from scratch and saying, if we take where we are at the moment, what's the best thing to do? And, and having a, a, a almost a democratic discussion about it, which is very sensible. Thank you. I think what we can do, Lengi, is that when we finish our work, we can make a, a document for our team here. And then once we go through that and approve, we can circulate to others. And we can work um, that way to come to a consensus and then come up with a pathway or recommendations or SOP for PD ligation in the Northwest. Um, OK. Whatever. Darima is still there? No. I'm here and um, thank you so much for the lovely discussion today. It was very informative, opens our eyes towards what more can be done how we should be tackling with the smaller PDAs that we come across. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.